Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Suchu. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the um, School of Computer Science and Engineering Colloquium. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce Ryan Marcus. Uh, Ryan is a uh, postdoc at MIT working with Tim Kraska. Uh, he joined MIT in 2019. Uh, before that, he got his PhD from Boston University uh, with Olga Papa, Papa Emanuelu. Um, and even before that, uh, Brian was an, a high performance computing engineer at the Los, Los Alamos National Labs. So he has hands on experience on dealing with um, uh, large scale systems. Uh, Brian's goal is to uh, build the next generation uh, big data systems. And his main ambition is to use uh, to build systems uh, that use learning in order to optimize their um, uh, they are uh, working. He has a, a very clear uh, understanding of why this is needed because systems become way more complex and the hardware becomes way more complex. And uh, his thesis is that uh, learned systems is a way to go and to support these. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, Ryan's work is perhaps the best um, uh, example of work in this space. And today he's going to talk uh, to talk to us about this. And without further ado, Ryan, please take, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so yep, I'm Ryan, postdoc at MIT, work with Tim Kraska and, and Sam Madden over there. Um, I apologize for, for not wearing a suit. I forgot during my, my first job interview and then realized, you know, why lie? You, what you see is what you get. Uh, this is what I would wear on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what I'm wearing now. Um, I wanted to uh, talk to you all today about some exciting advancements that, that we've had in, in the field of machine learning for query optimization. Um, but before I get started, I want to sort of set the background uh, for why this is important and why we're doing it in the first place. So most of my research is based on an observation that hardware complexity is growing exponentially. We're seeing new kinds of CPUs, new kinds of FPGAs, new kinds of GPUs, all these different new kinds of devices. And in addition to that exponential growth in hardware complexity, we're also seeing an exponential growth in application diversity. The thing that people want to do with data systems are getting more and more complex every single time. But unfortunately, the number of systems designers at best is growing linearly. So we have this gap between the systems designers and the complexities that we're trying to get. And our old model of sort of having one system designer pick an application and pick a piece of hardware and design a system for it isn't really scaling anymore. So I think the way out of this problem, the way to continue to take advantage of more and more hardware and the way to support more and more applications is with an idea um, that has a whole bunch of different names, machine programming, instance optimized systems, learn systems, et cetera. But what all of these have in common is that they share three simple principles. The first is that we believe these new next generation of systems should be able to invent new approaches to solve the user's problems automatically. This could mean coming up with different query plans or even creating entirely different algorithms. Second, we think these systems should adapt to the user's workload and underlying hardware. If you scale up the machine the database is on, the database should scale up its performance without the user having to change a whole bunch of different knobs. If the user's workload suddenly changes, the database should reconfigure itself to best support that change. And finally, these, we think these systems should be intentional. They should have a more semantic understanding of the user's intention um, than you know, your, your standard database that just SQL in results out. Using this better understanding of databases uh, of the user's intention, we can do things like prediction and security maintenance and, and all kinds of awesome things. So obviously that is a very, very, very broad mandate. Um, my work has focused on a couple of very specific areas during my PhD dissertation at, uh, at Brandeis. I worked on automatic cloud management, elasticity, that sort of thing. And during my postdoc at MIT, I worked on learned index structures as well as learned query optimization. Um, during this talk, I'm just gonna mostly focus on learned query optimization because I think it's a good signifier of where this work is going and the sort of techniques and themes that are used within it. Um, so in this talk, first I'm going to talk about what query optimization is and the motivation for learning, for using machine learning in this problem in the first place. Then I'm going to give a very brief description of NEO and highlight sort of like the key observation result that we saw from this. This was our first attempt at doing learn query optimization. And then after that, I'm going to talk about the key ideas inside of BOW, which was our second and arguably more practical attempt at solving the same problem. Um, so query optimization is essentially a compilation problem. You have to translate some complex requests for information, normally in the form of a SQL query, um, into a program that runs very, very quickly. So for example, with these, this database shown on the screen here, a user might say, okay, for each one of the professors in the professor table, give me their administrative contacts from the admin table. And the fundamental operation that we're using in order to do this kind of data processing is called a join. Um, 
At the risk of explaining this to a room full of people who already know what this is, a join is essentially an operation where you take all of the rows from the left-hand side table and you match them with all the corresponding rows on the right side table. Physically, there's quite a few different ways to do this. You could do it with a simple pair of nested loops. You could do it with hash tables. You could do it by sorting and merging. There's a lot of different options. Um, but the problem is generally a lot more complicated than that simple example I just showed you. So you can imagine a database schema that describes actors, uh, production companies, the films that those actors are in, and the, uh, which company produced which film. And on such a database, I might ask a question like, okay, show me all of the movies starring Scarlett Johansson that were produced by Sony. In order to solve this question, I have a lot of different options. Logically, what I want to do is I simply want to take all of these tables and I want to merge them together. But physically, there's a lot of different choices that I can make. Luckily, the join operator from relational algebra has this wonderful problem uh, property that it's associative and commutative, so we can move it around and we can build kind of any binary tree that we want out of these particular relations and still get the correct results. So, for example, one way that I could execute this query is first I could find all of the movies with Scarlett Johansson in them, and then I could filter out those movies to find only the movies that were produced by Sony. Another equally valid way to process this query would be to first find all of the movies produced by Sony and then filter out the movies that have Scarlett Johansson in them. A third and possibly more complex option to solve this query would be to, in parallel, find all of the movies produced by Sony and all of the uh, movies starring uh, Scarlett Johansson and then take the intersection of those two sets. All three of these plans are equally valid ways of, uh, of computing the user's query. The only difference will be in their performance and what determines with one query plan is better or worse than another has to do with the specifics of the database. You know, if Scarlett Johansson and more movies than Sony produced, did Sony produce more movies than the average production company? Questions like that will determine which one of these query plans is the fastest. Um, but even after you pick the general order of operations that you want to do things in, you still have to pick a physical operator for each one of the joins involved in the plan. So for example, I might choose this plan, which corresponds to finding all of the movies produced by Sony and then filtering out for just the ones with Scarlett Johansson. And now I have to pick different operator types for this particular plan. So for example, I could decide that I want to do each one of these physical joins, the hash join as an example. And again, which property is best will depend upon the actual uh, relations in the database. Now, the number of query plans that you can build are very, very, very large. With just 19 relations, which is a modestly sized query, there are already more than two to the 32 possible query plans. So it's a super exponential number. This thing blows up really, really, really fast. In addition to the problem space being absolutely huge, most query plans are really, really bad. On the left side of the slide, you can see a histogram that's showing for one particular query, uh, the distribution of quality of every single possible query plan for that particular query. So you can see there are some query plans that are super, super, super good that will execute in just a second for this particular plan. And then there are some queries that are super, super, super bad that will take over a day or over four days in order to execute. Uh, to do this experiment for everything over a day, we used a simulator to estimate how much longer it would take. So picking a plan at random, really, really, really terrible, but there's many, many, many plans. So we need some way in order to take this huge space and narrow it down. So the component that takes this huge space and narrows it down in most database management systems is the query optimizer. And these query optimizers are massively complex. In Postgres, which is abbreviated as PG in these slides, um, there's, over four, there's 42,000 lines of code dedicated to just this query optimization problem. In SQL Server, which is a commercial database system provided by Microsoft, there is a million lines of code dedicated to just this task of query optimization. Oracle, which is another uh, commercial company that makes a database management system, wouldn't tell me how many lines of code were involved in their optimizer, but they would tell me that they have 45 to 55 full-time employees working on nothing but query optimization all the time. Using a very conservative estimate for how much they're paid, this means Oracle spends at least $5 million a year just on query optimization. In addition to these things being incredibly complex and expensive to maintain, they're also not particularly good. They're optimized for a very general case, which most users don't find themselves in. So for most users, you have to tune that query optimizer per database instance, per application that you're actually using. So for example, with the Oracle Query Optimizer on one particular data set, we were able to get a 22% bump in performance simply by tuning the optimizer to our underlying data set. So really expensive, really complicated, requires humans in the loop in order to tune them. So the way that these things are normally structured is in a number of different modules. 
There'll be a cardinality est estimation module, which is responsible for guessing the size of particular subplans by guessing how, okay, how many movies did Sony produce? Okay, how many movies did Scarlett Johansson star in? And these are normally it, uh, implemented using things like histograms. They use uniformity assumption. They might have a most frequent value list, those sorts of techniques. The second component is a cost model. The cost model is responsible for taking those estimated size from the cardinality estimator and guessing, okay, here's how long it's actually gonna take to run this particular plan. If you're doing a hash join of two relations with specific sizes, here's my guess at how long that'll be. These things are normally you know, simple polynomials that follow the big O of the underlying uh, join operator and they tend to have hand-tuned constants and that sort of thing. These two things are combined together in a dynamic programming search problem that tackles this NP-hard problem of finding the best possible query plan tree, assuming your cardinality estimates and your cost models are the same. Um, so the way that this gets actualized and deployed in a real system is that you'll have some query queue and it'll arrive into the system and it'll get sent into the optimizer. Then the optimizer will spit out, do all of its processing and it will compute an execution plan. That execution plan will then get sent to the execution engine, which will actually run the plan, execute the program, process the results and give them back to the user. But the execution engine actually produces an additional piece of information besides the query result that is very interesting to us as database uh, in the database community. And that is the execution engine also produces a latency. It tells us, hey, I executed this plan that you thought was going to be really fast. Here's how long it actually took. We've known for quite a while in the database community that there should be some way to create a feedback loop. There should be some way to take this latency information that's coming from the execution engine and use it as a sort of grade for how well our optimizer did and then tweak and tune the optimizer so that it can do better and better. Um, however, the exact specifics of how to make this uh, feedback loop have uh, kind of escaped us. And there were a lot of different attempts. Uh, the, our attempt at it, we called uh, NEO. And the idea behind NEO was to take all of that cardinality estimation stuff, all of that cost modeling stuff and throw it out. We were gonna do an all learned everything end to end from beginning to end. So the idea behind NEO was replace all of that stuff with a deep reinforcement learning module that's going to do the entire query optimization process. And the two big things that came out of NEO with some serious caveats that I'll give in a minute um, is that there's a very, very deep connection between what deep reinforcement learning is doing, what it's computing and how standard query optimization techniques work. The second thing uh, is we, that we were very happy about is that with about 24 hours of training on a stable workload, we were able to outperform those commercial systems using a purely learned method. So the way that uh, NEO works is by, uh, the best way to explain how NEO works is to think about the problem of query optimization as finding a path through a graph. So in your traditional query optimizer, you have some kind of cost model that you assume is 100% correct. And you say, okay, this cost model is able to tell me the cost of an intermediate plan. So for example, if I'm trying to join the relations A, B, C together, I could take the top path of this graph and taking that top path of the graph would represent joining A on the left and B on the right first, and then not having C join. Our cost model for this particular node at the top says, I think that this will cost one unit of computation. If I take the top path again, which represents joining C on the right side of that intermediate result, my cost function tells me, okay, this thing is gonna take five units of time, let's say five seconds. So the way that your traditional optimizer works is by using this cost function, performing a simple dynamic programming search through this particular graph to essentially find the shortest path through the graph. And you know, it will eliminate nodes until it reaches the final conclusion, the final node that it uh, is supposed to find. And after a lot of exploration, we'll discover, aha, the best possible plan has a cost of three. Now, when you're doing this dynamic programming, which you can sort of view as, as Dijkstra's being operated on this graph of exponential size, what you compute, you compute an intermediate value in that computation. And the intermediate value that you compute is often called the memoization table. And inside of that memoization table, what you're keeping track of is you're saying from this node, the shortest possible, possible path to my destination is length three or length four or length two or whatever have you. So after the algorithm completes, this memoization table for my root node will say, okay, from this root node, the best possible plan that you can possibly build up to has a cost of three. It turns out that this memoization table is exactly what you compute in deep reinforcement learning. So in deep reinforcement learning, we don't assume that we have a perfect cost function. Instead, what we assume is we have some perfect Q function, an oracle for Q, which instead of mapping each state to its intermediate to each plan to its intermediate cost, instead maps each state to the best possible latency achievable from that state, which is exactly what you compute in the memoization table. So instead of assuming that we have a perfect cost model and then doing a search on top of that perfect cost model, 
we jump right to predicting the results of that search in the first place. Now, if you had such a magical key function, then the task of query optimization would be extremely easy. You would just do a best first search through this graph and be like, okay, I'm just gonna follow the lowest numbers and you'd arrive at your plan in linear time. This might be surprising because there's exponential space, but when you compare it back to the dynamic programming algorithm, you'll realize that the final backtracking part of Dijkstra's algorithm where you go through this memoization table is also linear. So everything checks out and asymptotically seems to make sense. The problem, of course, is that we do not have this Q function. So what we do in deep reinforcement learning, or at least in value iteration deep reinforcement learning, is we approximate this Q function using some kind of Q hat, which is normally represented by you know, some neural network or some function line. And the way that this is done is through a process called value iteration. Initially, you start out with a totally random Q function. Your Q function just maps each state to what is essentially a completely random number. Then, just like you assume your cost model and your cardinality estimates were 100% correct, you assume that that randomly initialized Q model is 100% correct. You play out the game as according to that Q model, you build a query plan, you execute that query plan, and then you use that data that you got from the execution to refine and better train your Q model. You then assume that the new model that you get is completely correct and you repeat this process over and over and over again. With some modest assumptions about the type of function approximator that you're using, and given a very, very long time horizon, there's very nice theoretical proofs that for any Markov decision process of which query optimization is one, this value will, this uh, procedure will eventually converge to an optimal value, which is very, very nice. But of course, in practice, we might not have that very, very, very long time horizon. Um, so instead of going into more of the details of NEO and, and, and to allow us to get to, to the, the context about a battle a little sooner, I'm going to jump to the experimental results of applying this very basic idea to query optimization. So the plot that you're looking at here shows the number of query iterations on the x-axis. Each query iteration represents a batch of around 200 queries. The dashed gray line at 1.8 represents the performance of the Postgres optimizer. That's sort of the open source baseline. And the dashed line at 1 represents the performance of the Oracle optimizer, which is our commercial baseline. And after about 40 iterations or 24 hours of training approximately, our NEO system is able to outperform the commercial system on its own engine, which we thought was a really great result. So one way of reading this plot would be to say that if you want to go from the line at 1.8 to the line at 1, you need a $100 billion company. But if you want to go from the line at 1.8 to the red line, you just need a GPU. So this is potentially an extremely powerful technique, but it comes with a lot of caveats. So the first caveat that I want to mention is that Neo works really, really well on average. Your mean query latency goes down significantly when you use Neo. However, your tail latency can get much, much, much worse. And the reason for that comes back to the histogram that we were looking at before. Um, because deep reinforcement learning occasionally needs to explore other options, you're occasionally going to pick a pretty bad query plan. Now, in most deep reinforcement learning contexts, this isn't a problem. Imagine you're trying to train a deep reinforcement learning agent to play Pac-Man. If you're really, really bad at Pac-Man, you're going to die really quickly. You're going to sit in the middle and get eaten by a ghost, or you're going to run into a wall and then die. You're going to die really fast. So when you're bad at Pac-Man, you get a lot of episodes per wall clock minute. Right? You get to run and die and run and die and run and die many, 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 many times in a short period of time, which allows your network to get a lot of training and a lot of information. In query optimization, doing worse takes longer. If you pick a really, really bad query plan, like if you picked a query plan at random, you might pick one of the run that takes days to execute and instead of taking seconds to execute. So because of this, doing worse takes longer which means that tail latency will eventually you know, dominate our, our, our time and become a major problem. So this was a huge issue with Neo. It was great that we can improve the mean query latency, but people normally care about tail latency. So after, this, after we got this result, which we thought was very exciting, but maybe wasn't so practical, we reconsidered our approach of throwing out the entire query optimizer. Maybe we shouldn't take those million lines of code and that software that people had spent millions of dollars a year developing and throw it all in the bin just yet. Interestingly, if you look at a very basic traditional query optimizer, like one that you could transcribe from a textbook using very well-studied techniques that date back to the 70s, that query optimizer would land right here on this histogram. It would pick a plan that took a little longer than a minute. Now, that's much worse than the optimal plan, which just takes a second, you know, 60 times worse, much worse. But it's significantly better than the vast majority of randomly chosen plans. So the idea behind BAO 
which was our next project or the, the bandits optimizer was to take one of those traditional query optimizers that did such a good job of eliminating those ter that terrible, terrible side of the histogram and try to figure out how to steer it. Try to figure out how to take that traditional query optimizer and steer it farther and farther towards the left side of the histogram so that it could do better. The experimental highlights um, that we saw was that Bao was able to outperform a commercial optimizer after just an hour of training instead of 24 hours of training, and it was able to do it in a way that reduced latency even at the 99th percent tail, and was able to do it in a way that adapted to changes in workload schema and data, which is also something that Neo struggled with. So the way that Bao works is greatly inspired by the way that DBAs would debug a slow query. So imagine that you're a DBA and you're working on this database and you run some query, which I've called 16B, just an arbitrary name, and you notice it takes a full minute. You might be thinking to yourself, hmm, 60 seconds is way too long. This query is, is really, you know, uh, it shouldn't be taking this long. This doesn't make any sense. It's not reading that much data. So you ask your query optimizer to tell you what query plan it's using. You run an explain plan, which basically says, okay, optimizer, don't execute this query, just show me what you were doing. And as a DBA, you might notice, oh, Postgres decided to use a loop join plan here, but this query has really, really low selectivity. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. You should be using something like a hash join when you have a low selectivity query. So then what you can do as a DBA is you can tell Postgres, okay, don't use nested loop join on this uh, particular query. Just turn that off, completely take it out of your search space, find me something else. And when you do this, you'll see a massive improvement. This query goes from taking 60 seconds to taking just 20 seconds, like a 3x improvement. Everything seems great. So then what you might do as a DBA is you say, okay, there's some bug with the Postgres loop join code. It's picking something that it shouldn't be picking. I'll just disable that loop join everywhere. I'll apply that hint that I used to turn off loop join and I'll apply it to the entire database. When you do that, you might notice that some other queries like 24B suffer a massive, massive regression because they are highly selective. So with a loop join on, 24B finishes in just half a second, but with, uh, but with loop joins off, it takes a full 20 seconds because it can no longer take advantage of indexes. It's like a 40X regression. That's obviously unacceptable. You can't have such a large regression on another query. So we have to undo that. So we know that we need some hints for either 16B or 24B. So as a DBA, you now have a couple options. One thing that you could do is you could find every single instance of query 16B everywhere in your entire code base. You could flag that instance of 16B with a, hey, don't use loop join here. You could track that through your versioning control system and keep it up to date when new versions of the database come out or when your, and, and when your data changes. Or option two, you can set no loop join as the default, and then you can go find all of the regressions and label those individually and track them through your version control and new versions of the database optimizer and as your data changes. Obviously, both of those options are a huge pain in the ass. So what most DBAs do is option three, which is give up. So our idea behind BOW is when a query comes into the system, is there some way that we can automatically determine what the right query hint is to use? So that when 16B arrives in the system, we turn off loop join. And when 24B arrives in the system, we leave loop join on. And the way we decided to approach this was by modeling the different hints that we could give the database as arms in a contextual multi-arm bandit problem. So what this means without diving into a world of machine learning terminology is that when a query arrives in the system, we send it to the traditional query optimizer, but instead of asking the traditional query optimizer for one plan, we ask it for a whole bunch of plans. For each one of our hints, we say, okay, give me a plan that only has loop join. Give me a plan that only has hash join. Give me a plan that only has merge join. And you build up all of these different plans from your traditional query optimizer. Then you take each one of those plans and you run them through a predictive performance, a performance prediction model. And that performance prediction model will guess and it will say, okay, I think this one will take 20 seconds and this one will take 25 seconds and this one will take 18 seconds. You say, great, I want the 18 second variant. You send the 18 second plan off to the execution engine. The execution engine does that, executes the plan. And then you observe, aha, when I executed this plan, I thought I was going to see a latency of 18 seconds, but I actually saw a latency of 38 seconds. So I'll add that into my model experience. I'll redo my training process so that my performance model works better next time. Now, this architecture begs two very obvious questions. The first question is, what is this performance prediction model? It obviously has to do really well in order to differentiate between which one of these plans is better. And the second is, how are you going to train this model in a way that respects exploration of you know, new ideas and new policies versus exploitation of knowledge that we already have? 
So I'm going to answer the first question first and talk about the predictive model. So we know that Thou needs a good predictive model in order to differentiate between the different plans that come out of the traditional query optimizer. The problem here is that query plans have a tree structure, and most of our standard machine learning tools, our decision trees, our SVMs, our linear regressions, et cetera, et cetera, all take vectors as input. So one thing that we could do is we could take our query plan tree and we could manually engineer some features. We could like count the number of join operators and the total sizes of various things and costs and flatten all that information down into one vector and then use one of those off the shelf techniques. This is tempting, but it doesn't really represent how machine learning and especially how deep learning have become effective in the last couple of years. So in order to understand how machine learning uh, and especially deep learning have become so effective, I wanna look, uh, analyze two domains where we've seen massive success from deep learning, computer vision and natural language processing. So in computer vision, the prevalent architecture that tends to, the prevalent kind of neural network that tends to dominate most of the benchmarks is a convolutional neural network. And the idea behind a convolutional neural network is that you take a little filter, a little three by three filter, and you slide it across your image, taking a dot product each time to induce a new image. And that little three by three filter can do a lot of very interesting image processing operations. It can do a low pass filter. It can be an oriented edge detector. It can be a color detector, et cetera. That convolutional neural network, convolutional operator is very, very good at identifying the low level visual features that we know are important to an image. In fact, we're so confident that they're important to finding low level features in, in the image that when we look at the actual human eyeball and the eyeballs of various animals, we see that they're doing a very, very similar operation. In, in natural language processing, we see that attention mechanisms tend to be the dominant mechanism that is used today. And attention mechanisms are designed to be really, really good at identifying long-term dependencies within a sequence. So if there's a word at the start of your sentence that modifies the word at the end of your sentence, the attention network has a natural tendency to give you features that uh, represents that dependence and, and over a long term in a sequence. This general idea of when the network architecture gives you a leg up on finding good features is normally called inductive bias because the structure of the model is biasing your network towards detecting and learning various features that are useful for the task. Now, in computer vision specifically, convolutional neural networks are such a good inductive bias that you can take a randomly initialized convolution filter, not trained at all, just random values in there, and just train the last layer of your neural network and still get pretty good performance. So the inductive bias in a convolutional neural network is so strong that even a random feature, a random initialization of weights is very likely to get you a good feature. This is the reason why deep learning networks work so well. It's not that they find super magical combinations of, of variables out of chance, it's that they have a very, very strong inductive bias. That means that every single convolution filter that you have, it's like buying a lottery ticket with really, really good odds. So the question for us, uh, so, so the observation that we can make is that machine learning works very, very well when the model structure, the structure of the model that you're training matches the structure of the underlying task. Computer vision, convolutional neural networks, natural language processing, attention mechanisms. So the question for us becomes, how do we get a good inductive bias for query optimization. And so we can do something very, very similar to what Jan LeCun did when he created convolutional neural networks and we can ask the expert biological system. In this case, the expert biological system is us, the, you know, the DBAs, the human experts. So let's look at what a DBA might consider about various query plans and, and how they reason about it. So for example, if you were a DBA who was experienced with this database, you might notice that in this particular query plan, we have a whole bunch of stack sort join operators. If each one of those joins is sharing a key, this could potentially avoid a resort, which might be a very, very efficient and pipelined operation. However, if I instead showed you as a DBA this particular plan, where you have a hash join on top of a sort join on top of a hash join, you might notice, ah, each time you're doing a rehash or a resort, so uh, there's a 100% chance you're not reusing any intermediate values here. You're definitely rehashing a resort at every single layer of this plan. If you know a little bit more about this database, you might know that the appears in relation is pre-sorted on disk, which means that it's weird that our join mechanism isn't taking advantage of that ordering in any way. You would expect the appears in relation in a good query plan to be going into a sort join. Now, again, none of these things mean that the query, none of these things on their own mean that the query plan is bad. But what we as a DBA might do is notice a whole bunch of these things, a whole bunch of maybe call them bad smells. And then we would build those low level features, a hash on top of a sort, sort on top of a hash, a chain of hashes or a chain of sorts. 
we'll build those into higher level features. And once we have those higher level features, we might use those to judge the quality of a query plan. So the moral of the story is that we examine local structure first, and then we build those local structures into higher and higher level features until we make a judgment about the entire query plan. So how can we get a neural network to do this? It turns out there's this awesome idea called tree convolution, which is very similar to image convolution, except on top of trees. So imagine that you have the query plan tree shown here on the left. Um, one what possible tree convolution filter is shown in the middle using you, you know, some human readable notation. Normally, these are all just vectors. So the way that we perform tree convolution is by taking our filter, the tree in the middle, and lining it up with the uh, parent node of our new tree. So we, you know, the purple boxes, the red boxes, and the green boxes. And then we do a dot product and we take the sum. So we see that hash matches hash, so that's one point. Purple box, we see that sort matches sort, so that's another point, red box. And C does not match zero, green box. So our total score at this node is two. So in our new tree, our output of this tree convolution operator, we have a two. Then we take this filter and we slide it down the tree. Now the sort node becomes our purple, the A becomes our red, and the B becomes our green. We repeat this process until we've induced an entirely new tree. Now what's happened here is that this particular tree filter turns out to be a feature detector for a hash on top of a sort. For any query plan that you put into this uh, particular tree filter, you're gonna get a big number, the tree's gonna light up when you have a hash on top of a sort, and it's gonna be zero everywhere else. So it can be viewed as a feature detector for a hash on top of a sort. Another example uh, of one of these tree convolution filters might be one like this, which looks for a sort with the relation B going into it. And you can imagine that for any particular tree, you're going to get a value that's lit up when there's B going into a sort join, and you're going to get zeros everywhere else. So the trick behind a tree convolutional network is to take a whole bunch of these different filters and to stack them up. Remember, you know, I, in my examples, they were like sort question mark and hash question mark, but usually they're just vectors of parameters that are dot producted together, and you learn those all in an end-to-end -end way in order to make your prediction at the end. If you'd like more information about tree convolutional neural networks and how they work, I suggest you take out, uh, check out either the Neo paper where we go into some depth about what the filters learn and, and how exactly the mathematics are defined, or our open source implementation, which is the, uh, the bottom most uh, link on, on this particular slide. Um, so now that we have a good predictive model, now that we understand how to build a deep neural network that has an possibly good inductive bias for understanding query plans, the next question that we have is, well, how do we train that neural network in order to make good predictions? So one option to train that neural network is to use a gigantic query log and then train continuously. So we'll get a gigantic query log, we'll train one time, and then every once in a while, we'll redeploy that model out to various people after we collect more data. This is seemingly easy, but it doesn't really adapt, right? This is your sort of standard supervised learning. You collect a whole bunch of data, you train a model, you deploy the model, and then you, know, you do the next version. Might, might be easy-ish in production, but it, it won't adapt to, to, to rapid changes that are happening inside of the database. The second option, which is what we do in the BAL paper, is to periodically retrain the model in an online fashion. And in our case, we use an algorithm called Thompson sampling. So the fundamental problem that we're trying to solve with adaptive training is balancing exploration and exploitation. If you wanted to do pure exploitation, if you wanted to just take all the information that was in the model and use it to the greatest extent possible, you would always pick the lowest predicted query plan. So in this case, I would always pick the loop, loop join plan. If I wanted to do pure exploration, if I wanted to gather the best possible training data from my model, so it had the most diverse information so that it could create the best possible uh, predictions, then I would always choose randomly. I would completely ignore what the model said, and I would pick IID between the different values. Now, in practice, you want to balance between these two components. And the reason that you want to balance instead of a pure exploitation strategy is, is uh, best illustrated by example. Suppose my predictive model is guessing nine seconds for the loop plan. And it's really, really, really confident that that loop plan is going to take nine seconds. And it's predicting 25 seconds for the hash plan, but it's really uncertain about that prediction of 25 seconds. It thinks, oh, maybe it could be three seconds, maybe it could be 50 seconds. I'm going to give you know, this expectation answer of just 25. If you do pure exploitation, if you always pick the lowest one, you're going to run that loop plan every single time. And you're never going to discover whether or not the hash plan would actually be significantly better or not. So 
one way when the database community encounters problems like this, if they try to fix it, is by adding some kind of IID noise to each one of these samples. They'll say, okay, I'll take the prediction that the neural network gives me, and I'll add like a Gaussian noise with mean zero and variance three or something like that. Um, this is okay. This is better than doing pure exploitation. But the problem with this approach is that it doesn't, it doesn't respect the uncertainty of the model. If we're really, really confident about our prediction of nine, then we should add a very small fuzz factor to nine. And if we're very, very unconfident about our prediction of 25, well, then we should add a lot more variance to that particular prediction. But it turns out that figuring out how confident a neural network is in a particular answer is actually quite a difficult problem. So instead of trying to somehow quantify how confident our network is about one prediction or another, we're going to do this trick called Thompson sampling. And the trick of Thompson sampling is we are always going to pick the lowest. We're going to do that pure exploitation strategy where whatever the neural network says, we're always going to pick the query plan with the best predicted latency. But we're going to train the neural network in a way that moves that fuzz factor into the model itself. So that if we're really, really, really confident that a particular query is going to take nine seconds, then every single time we train the neural network with Thompson sampling, we're going to predict nine seconds. But if we're really, really unsure that a hash plan is going to take 25 seconds, then sometimes when we train the neural network, we're going to predict 25. But sometimes when we train the network, we're going to pick three or we're going to predict 50. And the easiest way to understand Thompson sampling in this context is by thinking about what we're actually doing when we train machine learning models. So imagine for a second that you're, you can only change how the model is trained and your agent is always going to pick the lowest possible prediction. So in this regime, if you do regular old model training, if you just train your model normally, you'll end up doing pure exploitation, right? You're always picking the lowest, you're training the model normally, that's what's happening. One way to view what you're doing is that you're setting the model weights, the parameters of your model, to the expectation of the distribution of the model weights given the data. This is your maximum likelihood estimator, you know, your blue least, uh, least squares regression, you know, all that good stuff that you learned in statistics class. The most likely model given your parameters, the model with the highest probability under the distribution of the model weights given your data. If you wanted to do pure exploration, if you wanted to always pick, if you wanted to always make the uh, query plan with the lowest predicted latency randomly, then you would simply sample the model weights from the distribution of the prior of the model weights. This means that every single time you train your neural network, every single time you sample from the prior distribution of the weights, you'll be getting a neural network that makes a different random prediction for all of its inputs. The beauty of Thompson sampling, and again, this Thompson sampling is not our idea. This is a very old idea from a long time ago. The beauty of Thompson sampling is that you can perfectly balance these two constraints by instead of taking the expectation of the distribution of the model weights given the data, you can instead sample from the distribution of your model weights given the data. When you sample from this distribution, what you're doing is if you have a whole lot of data suggesting that one particular plan should be, uh, should be predicted to nine seconds, you're very, very, very likely to sample model weights that predict nine for that particular query plan. But if you have very, very little data suggesting that a hash plan should take 25 seconds, then each time you retrain and you resample your model, you're going to get a neural network that gives you a very different prediction. Now, in practice, there's a whole lot of ways to do this sampling procedure. The easiest is probably by taking a bootstrap of your training data, just sampling with replacement from your training data, and then doing the normal maximum likelihood training. But you can also emulate this a little bit using dropout or a bunch of other techniques. The technique we use in the paper is, is, is just by using a bootstrap. Um, so that's how we balance the exploration versus exploitation while BAO is running in an online sense. One huge advantage of the BAO architecture, one thing that makes it really, really, really impactful for query optimization is that if you come up with a new cardinality estimate, if you come up with a new you know, theoretical upper bound for a particular problem, or you come up with some new piece of information, some feature that you think is highly related to query optimization, like what's in the cache or something like that, that's extremely easy to integrate into the optimizer. You can simply take that new piece of information that you have, that new feature, tack it onto the vectors in the tree convolutional neural network, and BAL will automatically adjust and incorporate that piece of information into its decision making. Of course, there's no theoretical guarantees about what the predictive model will do with that particular piece of information, but if it has a lot of cross entropy with the target, with the prediction that you're trying to perform, we're pretty confident that neural networks will do a good job of learning that type of thing. Um, in addition, you can also mm, slightly less easily extend BAL with new optimization strategies. 
For example, suppose you come up with some new join algorithm that's really, really, really great. If you wanted to integrate that join algorithm into a traditional query optimizer, you'd have to modify the cost model, modify the search function, modify the cardinality estimation module, potentially do all kinds of work to get that new implementation of an operator into the system. With BAO, you can simply add another arm to the contextual multi-arm bandit problem. One caveat here is that every single time you add another Boolean option to BAO, you get an exponential growth in the number of plans that BAO can potentially choose from. But dealing with this exponential growth by doing some manual or heuristic pruning is probably still easier than implementing an entirely new operator into a traditional query optimizer. So BAO has this nice extensibility profile that new features or things you might be relevant to query optimization are extremely easy to integrate and new types of optimization strategies can be added with a little bit of work. So, I don't have a ton of experimental slides, but I do want to emphasize a very interesting uh, and highlight the difference between the BAO and the NEO system. So the NEO system can build any query plan that it wants. It's com a completely free to choose any query plan that you could possibly imagine under the sun, any binary tree, any access path, et cetera. BAO, on the other hand, is much, much more constrained. BAO can only quit query plans that would be generated by the underlying query optimizer with some set of hints. So NEO, way, lots and lots and lots of degrees of freedom. BAO, very, very limited degrees of freedom. And the way that this plays out is, I think, really highlighted when we look at stable versus dynamic query workloads. So in the stable query workload, which is shown on the left side of the screen, we can see that the blue line representing BAO, you know, it's got a very solid slope. Lots of queries are being processed every hour, which is really, really good. But eventually, after 60 hours or so of training, NEO catches up. And the reason that NEO catches up and then exceeds what BAO can do is because NEO has more degrees of freedom. When the workload is stable, NEO can do very, very tiny exploration, explorations, make very some small incremental pieces of progress in order to understand very, very specific and novel query plans that a traditional query optimizer would never think of. And when the workload is stable, NEO is very, very good at eventually finding those plans. However, when the workload is dynamic, when the schema, the data, and the workload are all changing all the time, we see a very different story. Again, the bow line has a reasonably solid slope. There's a couple of plateaus in it now, those little flat spots, but mostly it's still, still reasonable. But the NEO line, on the other hand, takes significantly longer to even beat the open source optimizer and never, at least in the length of our experiments, catches up with BAO. And the reason for this is because every time there's a change in the underlying data schema or workload, NEO is kind of at a loss, right? It doesn't know that that change happened. It has to relearn what it used to know about the previous uh, state of the system, again, in the new state of the system. And the result of this is an increase in tail latency. And these plots make that tail latency extremely visible. So because we have time on the x-axis and because we have number of queries on the y-axis, you can think of the slope of each one of these lines as the number of queries processed per hour. So any flat spot, any little plateau in any one of these lines represents a time where the system processed zero queries. So some of these really, really large flat spots that NEO has, especially on the, the right side of the graph here, um, represents you know, almost 30 minutes where zero queries were processed. If you care about tail latency, that's completely unacceptable, right? That's, you know, that, that major flat point is a big issue. And you can see even in the stable workload, there's a couple of those flat spots as Neo ventures onto the wrong side of that histogram and sort of picks an incorrect plan. So, so the takeaway that I want to give people from these slides is we see a very interesting trade-off between the number of degrees of freedom that we have to veer away from what our traditional human heuristics have and our maximum performance uh, that we can possibly achieve on a particular workload. These are obviously two points, two very extreme points on that spectrum. I think an interesting and open question would be to ask, is this trade-off fundamental? Is there some way to get the best of both worlds where we can have a high number of degrees of freedom, but we can still have good tail latency? Or if it is fundamental, is there some knob that we can turn to adjust how much X, you know, how many degrees of freedom that we want dynamically based on what we see in the workload? Um, Another experiment that we ran uh, just on BAO in order to show its sort of cost effectiveness, we tested BAO on three different workloads, the IMDB workload, which is the join order benchmark for those of you that are familiar with it, the stack overflow benchmark, which is a bunch of queries for the, the stack overflow people run for their analytic dashboarding, and then corp, which is a, uh, a, non, a corporate workload that was donated to us on the condition of anonymity from a large um, corporation that does uh, mobile gaming. Um, it was also their, their dashboard. Uh, the right-hand side plot here is showing the, the, uh, the time to execute an entire workload. You can see BAO 
beats Postgres by a pretty sizable margin on all of these data sets, which have different levels of dynamic behavior. But on the left side, we show the cost of executing these plans on the Google Cloud platform. Now, unfortunately, uh, I think I used to have some arrows on here that would show, but the proportions are slightly different. We seem to be slaving more time than we're saving money. And a natural question in a cloud environment is why is that happening, right? If you reduce the amount of time you're using by 50%, your cost should also go down to 50%. And the answer is training overhead. When Bao needs to train its tree convolutional neural network, it needs a GPU. It has to ask Google Cloud Platform, hey, for the next two to three minutes, I'm gonna need a GPU, rent me one so that I can use it and I can process my query and I can train my network and then I release that GPU. And when you do this uh, training process, you get slightly more cost. Um, but the, the reason that we plot both of these is to show that Bao, even with that uh, additional constraint of having to train its neural network is still extremely cost-effective on, on, on these cloud platforms. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about and one of the ways that we tried to validate BAO was by taking it to big industry you know, partners and, and, and players and sort of asking them like, hey, how can you, uh, how could you use this or how, how could you uh, make use of this? And so we approached Microsoft about it and Microsoft has this awesome system called Scope. And Scope is their telemetry system. So every time you open the, the start menu on your Windows computer, every time you create a new Word document, every time you do a Bing search, every time you ask Cortana a question, that's a row in this database an absolutely massive database that's super important to you know, Microsoft's operations and, and analytics and whatnot. And we uh, you know, approached Microsoft about using this idea and they were really excited about it, but they didn't wanna shove every single scope query through BAO because it was an unproven technology. So what the scope team did uh, let us do was run a portion of the queries that they considered their, their most problematic, their, their problem children, so to speak, through the, uh, the BAO optimizer. And they gave us their 1000 most problematic queries and we piped those off through BAO and we set up a little training loop and all that. And the results are shown in this plot. So each one of these bars represents one of those problem queries and the distance below zero is the savings that BAO achieved by the hint that it picked over the traditional query optimizer and the bars above zero are the regressions. So on a couple of queries, we were able to get these absolutely massive 4,000 plus second uh, savings at the cost of very, very few, but still some uh, regressions at the at the other end of the spectrum. Um, Microsoft was, was was thrilled about this. I, I think they were they were they were pretty happy with the work because we were able to to, to reduce the tail latency by by a bunch. So we were super happy with this result. Or we're, we're really looking forward to to continuing to work with them and 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 push more and more queries into BAO. Um, this was the slide that my advisor told me that I had to have uh, to demonstrate that I have like some kind of crazy impact on the academic community or whatever. Um, it makes me really uncomfortable to say it, but I'm going to get through it anyway, so don't get in trouble. Um, after we released Neo and Bao, we were really, really excited to see that a whole bunch of new papers on learned query optimizations uh, started coming out. You know, our group wrote some more, but there were over 75 new papers talking about learned query optimization. Um, uh, which we, we we feel like we 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 started. Um, a lot of these papers look at different types of models, different types of ways of training Neo, different types of database systems that it can be applied to. You know, applying it to DAG query plans as opposed to trees, applying it to distributed systems, etc. Really, really exciting work. Um, we were also really happy that the benchmark that we built for learned index structures um, was used in 100% of the new of the new learned index structures papers that were submitted at the last sigma. So we feel really good about the learned systems work that we're doing, and there's some evidence that it's having impact on the broader research community. Um, I said we a lot during this talk. Uh, both of the the systems are primarily my work, but primarily means you know a plurality stake, not a majority. These, uh, all of these wonderful collaborators that I've had throughout the years had a massive influence on, on all of my work, either by helping me you know, improve the technical code or by providing excellent mentorship. And of course, I would love to add all of you lovely folks to this slide as well. Um, the next steps for me are uh, a couple fold. One of them is an ongoing collaboration with MIT um, They're the project that we call SageDB. The idea behind SageDB is to take all of these learned components, learn indexing, learn data layouts, learn query optimizations, and stick them all under one roof and see what happens. Um, there's some optimists in our group who are thinking, oh, they're all going to play well together and the whole system's going to be great. And then there are some pessimists, or I would say realists, who think, well, maybe some of these learned systems are going to negatively 
uh, collide with each other, right? Maybe the learn query optimizer is going to make decisions that the physical layout doesn't like, or maybe vice versa. And there might be some interesting interplay. But either way, it should be it should be fun to put them all together. Um, outside of that collaboration with uh, with MIT and, and, and Intel is also involved in that. Um, I'm really looking forward into looking to automatic storage optimization. I think it's important that. It's weird that the query optimizer is totally independent of the physical layout and the physical layout is totally independent of the query optimizer. We need to integrate those two and have truly, to have truly end-to-end -end query optimization, we need to not just look at query plans, but also how the data is laid out on disk. I think we can go way beyond your standard learned data partitioning techniques um, that get used. I think we can do really, really smart things using program synthesis to come up with materializations for intermediate results that we can then integrate using complex rewrites into those various queries. And finally, I'm really interested in expanding the techniques that we use to learn query optimizations beyond relational database management system. One of the early success stories we have is looking at the Python garbage collector. We have a sample application where we were able to create a reinforcement learning powered garbage collector that for various web applications and caching systems was actually able to outperform expert tunings of those garbage collectors. So there's tons of exciting opportunities for these kind of learned systems components in, um, you know, in programming languages and operating systems in, in networks and in, in high performance computing and probably a bunch of other domains I haven't even thought of yet. And of course, I'd be super excited to work on those kind of problems with anyone who could stand. Me. Um, that's all for me. If you'd like, you can visit me on the internet at that address and follow me on Twitter. And if you want to reach out via email, there's the address. Um, I tend to check it pretty frequently, but with interviews, I've been a little slow, but feel free to leave a message and I promise I will get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, thanks, that's it. Thank you, Ryan. Um, let's give a, a virtual round of applause. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we started late, uh, so we, uh, we should take a few minutes for questions. And while people uh, uh, digest this um, a very interesting talk and think about questions, let me actually start with some questions myself. And uh, I just had a, a question uh, that was raised by some, some of your latest remarks. So it occurs to me that in many settings, the, the decision time, the time when you actually make the decision is decoupled from the time when you actually, uh, when, when the decision is actually applied. And I can think of uh, the, the uh, classical example is out of a prepared statement. Uh, when the query is prepared, it needs to be optimized, but when it's actually executed much later, this is when there is much more knowledge. You also talked about um, um, how much memory is available. The query optimizer is often ignorant of the amount of them. Do you have any thoughts about uh, if this can be, if this is a problem that requires a different approach or what, what are your thoughts about this, um, 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 this kind of problem? Yeah, great, great question. So I, I think it's actually even worse than what you suggest. There's the planning time, which is like the prepared statement or the time that you have optimization. There's execution, which is when the you know query is actually executed and it's actually ran through the engine. And then there's reward, right? You might not actually get the late, certainly you don't get the latency of the query until after it's finished executing at minimum. But if your reward function is something more complex like energy usage or disk IOs, you might have to wait even longer to sort of do the attribution work to figure out where, uh, where things fall. Now in Neo and Bao, we used a very, very simple formulation where query optimization happened at the same time as query submission and reward happened immediately after the query was executed. But more advanced systems and real systems obviously have more complex models. For decoupling the first two phases, it's relatively simple and our current prototype actually supports this decoupling. Basically what you do is you have some prepared statement that prepares your query plan. You use BOW at that exact moment and you, um, you use contextual information that may be wrong and then you execute the query later you observe some reward. Um, at some fixed interval, you invalidate your query plan cache. You say, okay, all those queries that I planned before, I'm throwing all of those out now. So that next time that query comes along, you can replan it with, uh, with BOW. And eventually we notice that automatically without us doing any intervention, the BOW optimizer learns to ignore for those prepared statements, the contextual information like the amount of memory available on the machine because it doesn't have any cross entropy with the target. Um, so, so, so that's nice that in that case, it sort of works out. The, the really tricky part, which you, which you alluded to, is when the execution is decoupled from the attribution or from the reward. That's really, really difficult because your optimizer might make a number of decisions. Bow might run many, many, many queries and only there might be some emergent effect on energy usage that only appears after 20, maybe or 30 queries are executed. That's a very hard problem because when Bao 
plans a query, we assume it's independent of whatever else is happening in the system. I don't have a good solution to that one, but I think it's I think it's really uh, excellent uh, for future work, especially because of the the energy and the network implications. Great, thank you. So, Magda, please, you're next. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ryan. Really a great talk and, and really exciting work. Uh, so one question is for systems like Neo and Bao, uh, in many kind of modern settings, we're going to have, you know, everyone's going to be in the cloud. And there's going to be one system that has one query optimizer and many tenants, all with their own specific database system. Uh, but it seems like in those kinds of contexts, your techniques could maybe perhaps leverage the fact that there are other tenants running other queries to kind of maybe accelerate the learning for each individual database. Uh, so maybe can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So the reason, uh, a, a related question that people often ask is, how in the world can your learn system, which has no human expertise, no human knowledge, no priors whatsoever, outcompete these incredible expert systems that we spent decades building? And one answer to that question is really snide, and you say, ooh, that's the power of deep learning. But the real reason is because the experts, the human experts building those query optimizers are trying to solve a general purpose problem, right? They're trying to write a query optimizer for any possible database. Whereas we, when we're learning a query optimizer, we're only trying to learn how to do query optimization on that specific database. So a lot of the power of Neo and Bao come from the fact that you have one type of hardware, you have one type of workload, you have one type of schema, and we can specialize, we can highly even, even overfit to that particular instance, which might mean your performance is terrible on another database. But in the context that you're talking about, the similarities between systems are still, are there's still some similarities, but now there's dissimilarities, right? There's multiple tenants, they're running on the same hardware. So the hardware is in common potentially, but the data is different. So one option would be to have sort of a core model that sits in the middle that tries to understand, you know, the overall similarities between the hardware and the different workloads, and then have a second specialized model for each individual database that sort of fine tunes it to that particular type. But it's also possible that with a large enough model with a really, really big capacity, you could actually do cross learning. You could actually figure out, oh, this company that is doing uh, um, e-commerce and this company that is doing e-commerce actually run very similar queries and I can use my experiments, uh, experience from e-commerce B to accelerate the queries of e-commerce A. And this is really, really, really interesting because it sounds at the onset like an amazing idea that we would really, really want, right? Of course, I want to benefit from the collective, collective wisdom of every Azure user, you know, but e-commerce company A, whose query experience is helping e-commerce B do better, might not be so happy with that situation. So I, I think the idea of multi-tenancy raises a ton of super, super interesting questions about how do I make sure that my data that I'm running in my database isn't uh, providing, you know, competitive knowledge uh, to a, you know, to a competitor, and also uh, how much information really is there shared between the two that can allow for um, uh, cross learning between the between the platforms. So yeah, um, I think I think it's a potentially really exciting space with some with some really interesting caveats that might need to be navigated around. Thank you. I do have another question. So um, the in in. in um... Um, database vendors, they often worry about uh, explaining uh, the, the actions of their, of their systems. Uh, and I know that you put some work into uh, making, making um, uh, BAO explain its decisions. Can you, ex can you explain a little bit how BAO works in terms of explaining its decisions and what your future thoughts are in this direction? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, just to give more context, one of the big biggest fears that DBAs have for adopting something like a learn, learn query optimizer is that what are they going to do when something goes wrong? When the learn query optimizer starts making incorrect decisions, how are they going to debug it? How are they going to fix it, et cetera? We have a lot of tools for traditional query optimizers. We have no tools for learn query optimizers. So DBAs are rightfully a little shaky. Um, with Neo, a giant problem we had is that our answer to that question was, well, we have this black box neural network. You can go analyze it with explainable AI techniques. Good luck, right? Um, which was obviously insufficient to a lot of DBAs. With BAO, the story is a little bit different. Because of the way that BAO works, we can easily switch from using that model as something that directs the query optimizer where to go and instead change it into a DBA tool. So for example, we have, we call it an advisor mode. So what, what BAO can do is when a DBA says, okay, explain to me this particular query that's misbehaving, BAO can say, okay, if I were in charge, here's the query hint that I would use. Here's the query plan that results from that, highlighting the differences between the two query plans. And here's how much time that I think you'll save. 
A DBA can then get confidence in that decision by executing the original query plan, seeing that bow indeed predicted that it would be bad and that it was bad by trying out the new hint, seeing like, oh, yep, indeed it did, this did make my query faster and then gain more confidence in the bow system that way. Now, in terms of explaining the actual hints that bow uses, there's two different audiences that are interested in that question. One audience is DBAs. DBAs wanna know, well, wait, why did you decide to turn off loop join for this particular query? Um, and to them, we don't have a great answer yet. Uh, we can basically say there's some explainable AI, te AI techniques that might help in the future, but for now it's kind of a black box. And the other audience that's interested in that question is database architects, right? Like we care about that. We wanna know what is this thing learning that's doing better than the commercial system? And for those, we can offer a better question. We can do sensitivity analysis. We can do some investigations into what the filters are learning at each layer of the tree and what changes to a query plan that we can make in order to induce change. And then we, you know, we can analyze and see what those are. So one interesting observation that we had when we were working on um, Postgres is that oftentimes the Postgres cardinality estimator underestimates the cardinality of a particular thing. In fact, it underestimates so often that you could add one to all of its estimates and things would be better. Um, but because of that underestimation, Postgres often over chooses the use of nested loop joins. Um, and so by over choosing nested loop joins so often in those particular situations where you have these underestimates, you know, that, that, that's a pattern that that Val picks up on. And if you take that same system and you move it onto a super, super low memory system, suddenly using index nested loop join is the correct thing to do. And that parameter sensitivity disappears. So there's no like sort of like taking the neural network and suddenly understanding like, oh, this is what's wrong with our optimizers. But there is little experiments that we can run and things that we can test to sort of validate hypotheses and, and figure it out. Um, a pessimist might say that that's post hoc rationalization. Um, someone who's a little bit more optimistic might say that it's, you know, it's an interesting playground that we can use to try to learn uh, what our optimizers are doing wrong by examining what Bao is correcting. Um, so yeah, short answer, I guess. Explainability is a problem. Bao makes it a little better, but there's still a lot of work to do. There is this question coming from the database lab and there are many people here, so I really cannot say no. So let's take one last question from the database lab. Uh, uh, so please go ahead. Uh, there's really rich semantic information, natural language information in the database. So in the top, you mainly focus on modeling the queries themselves. Uh, so are there ways to explore the, uh, the information from the data? That's a great question. So the normal featureization that we use in BOW really only takes advantage of information from the query plan, like the optimizer's estimates and things like that. Um, and, and the reason that we do that, we don't want to include any schema specific information inside of the Val model is so that if your schema changes or something like that, you don't have to retrace your model. Um, but in Neo, on the other hand, we tried very much to take advantage of that question. And one of the things that we created, we called them R vectors. Basically, we took various rows from the database and we trained an embedding model. Basically, given this one value of this particular row, guess the other values of the particular row to try to build like a rich semantic understanding of what predicates might be and what, what they might interact with. And we saw a very solid bump in performance from, from utilizing those. Um, so yeah, I think there absolutely is ways to incorporate knowledge from the database into uh, the uh, semantic knowledge from the database into the query optimization track. Um, but doing it in a way that allows the schema to change but not break your model is still kind of tricky. Thank you, Ryan, once again, and uh, we will stop here then. Thank you.